Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is June 10th, 2020. I, I found a lot of interest in this particular topic this evening, so I'll, I'll be curious to hear from any of the live audience members if uh, something in particular interests you about this topic. And, and, and I realize that some of you might have been thinking about uh, that I would be teaching about borderline personality disorder. And while I'll, I'll make reference to that, and of course it's related to borderline thinking and functioning, really it, it, it's a different kind of concept. And I'll, I'll explain that as I go. And it has with it some of the same kind of behaviors. Um, what got me into to thinking about this topic was what I'm going to call the, the kind of great divide I see in our public discourse these days. And I'm not going to I'm not going to speak about any of those specifically, but I'm going to talk about just as I've been watching the, the trauma spill out on social media and, and in the news, many people are hurting from, from COVID, from the, the recent race and racism issues to uh, our, our politics. And what I'm noticing is this, this kind of dialogue that looks and sounds like borderline thinking like all or nothing black black and white thinking um, and people having a difficult time listening to each other and, and creating a dialogue. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about this idea on a much more personal one-on-one -on -one therapy level. But as I look and search for topics, this was the thing that was on my mind for this evening. Um, so again, I'll make reference to borderline, but I'm really borderline personality disorder, but I'm really talking about a borderline functioning. And this graph that I'm showing you, for those of you that are watching, illustrates it. There are really two axes in mental health. There's the axes, and I didn't go, I didn't try to make a comprehensive list of possible diagnoses. You know, it can be major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, substance uh, use disorder, bipolar disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, compulsive obsessive disorder. The list goes on and on, right? We have an entire manual full of various diagnoses. And these are these are kind of styles around which our symptoms, our mental illness, if you will, is formed. It's, 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 it's the pattern of our symptoms. These become our diagnoses. But there's also a vertical axis, um, another axis that talks about the level of functioning. There's kind of a, a normal, a kind of a normal um, population, kind of what we would, we would call typical or normal functioning. But then you have these three levels of functioning that any one of us, when put under stress, can regress into these levels of functioning. And they go in this order from the most mild to the most severe. It starts off as neurotic, and then it gets all the way to psychotic. The term borderline, when we talk about borderline functioning, we're talking about, it's a phrase, a, a word that really talks about the difference between psychotic and neurotic functioning, right? Somewhere in between that, and I'll explain that more. But the point I want to make is that under stress, when we are having a trauma response in a given moment, uh, over a period of time, we can develop a borderline way of reacting, an all or nothing kind of way of reacting, a, a fight or flight kind of way of reacting, a black or white, either or kind of thinking. That's that's. It's a part of the kind of borderline thinking. I'll go into more detail as we go along. This is a way of understanding it. The levels of personality functioning from a neurotic state, you're talking about a stable, continuous, integrated identity, very close to what we might call, for lack of a better term, normal, with mature and flexible defenses, good reality testing, right? So most of us, most days are kind of fitting in that category of neurotic behavior, right? We're, we're, we have moments, but overall, we're fairly consistent, fairly stable. And then borderline is unstable, inconsistent, discontinuous identity, primitive defenses. That word primitive is important. I talk about this idea that we become each other's trigger, that you've, when you go home for a family function after being away for a while, or you visit the relatives, you'll watch this and see this in your spouse. You'll see them regress back to a much more primitive childish, immature way of functioning. So there are primitive defenses, very young, very underdeveloped defenses, um, but still some ad adequate reality testing. I mean, you haven't full, fully gone psychotic. If we are put under stress, it could happen also chemically, of course, 
But if we are put under enough stress, particularly fear, but it also can be pain and other traumas, we could develop a psychotic episode. And there's a genetic predisposition that lines up with all these levels of functioning, but there's also a threshold that all of us could cross. We could do it by ingesting, like I said, chemicals. It can be a, a, a drug-induced psychosis, but also a stress-induced. If you were if you were tortured, if you were traumatized, if you were terrified enough, you would lose your ability to reality test, to, 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 to stay grounded in reality. So psychotic functioning is fragmented, confused, disorganized identity, primitive defenses, and poor reality testing, right? The psychotic, if you respond to somebody with sometimes with, with a psychotic level of functioning with an empathic, for example, response, the psychotic individual will, will find you to be intrusive. They'll wonder if you're getting inside of their mind, right? Because they've lost all kind of ability to reason rationally. So you either become their, their enemy out to get them, or you become somebody that's intrusive, that's inside their head. So I wanted to talk about this as we see the trauma in our culture, in our families, in our lives. We're all experiencing various traumas at various times. We can watch for this, this level of functioning, this kind of trauma response, this response to external trauma. Now, this particular list I'm going to read to you is from Borderline Personality Disorder. And we can borrow from this list and understand what it means to be borderline functioning, to, to learn that all of us can regress to that kind of all or nothing, that, that, that vacillation between idealizing somebody or something or a situation to vilifying that, that same thing. I remember my therapist, she shared with me that she remembers in college, she walked into the bathroom and somebody had spray painted in the bathroom. If you're not for us, you're against us. That's essentially the lack of the middle path, the lack of integration, the lack of gray area. You'll find people with borderline functioning unable to see shades of gray, unable to see the positive sides of even somebody that they're in great, a great deal of conflict. They'll see sick people, psychologically speaking, and they'll find no relation to them on the more toward the neurotic or, or normal level of functioning, we would talk about even in our most, even in encountering somebody that, that we find to be very ill, mentally ill, we can understand and begin to see some similarities. You'll, you'll find this in graduate school. If you go attend graduate school and study psychology and diagnoses, you, you'll, you'll hear the story that clients, excuse me, therapists and training will constantly talk about seeing themselves in all the diagnoses. And that's true. Right? There's a, a little bit of us in them. There's a little bit, little bit of us in a borderline personality disorder, a person afflicted with it. There's a little bit of us in somebody with a narcissistic personality disorder or depression, major depressive disorder or anxiety. Sometimes we identify a great deal, but we can always kind of find some similarity. So let me read this list of symptoms from the disorder, not the level of functioning but from the disorder. An intense fear of abandonment, even going to extreme measures to avoid real or imagined separation or rejection, right? Most of the motivation for somebody suffering from borderline personality dis disorder is to prevent this threatened abandonment. Again, remember that in moments when we become reactive and triggered, in my marriage, most or at least many of my worst interactions from my wife are triggered by a fear that she's going to leave me, that she's going to abandon me, that I'm going to be too much. And though I don't suffer from the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, I can get into that borderline thinking, right? I can start to think that parents talk about this all the time, that we talk about this all the time at our intensives. We try to kind of combat this, kind of compete with this idea, this sort of thinking where we say, you know, you can love somebody and be angry at them at the same time. Borderline functioning doesn't allow for that. We don't allow people to be angry and hurt by us. 
you can say to your to your father, to your mother, some of what you did wasn't good enough. Just wasn't good enough. It hurt. It left a dent. And I know you still love me and I still love you. And both of those things can be true. We can start to look at ourselves in that kind of whole way. We don't have to be all good, all perfect. A pattern of unstable, intense relationships, such as idealizing someone one moment and then suddenly believing the person doesn't care enough or is cruel. That vacillation, right? You can you can begin to identify with some of these characteristics, I hope, mildly, moderately at least, in moments of stress or trauma or fear. Rapid changes in self-identity and self-image that include shifting goals and values and seeing yourself as bad or that you don't exist at all. Periods of stress-related paranoia and loss of contact with reality lasting from a few minutes to a few hours. That might be a more severe symptom, but we can all relate to, we can all relate to kind of a, a crazy spinning thought process. I had one not too long ago with my wife where I told myself a story. Right? I had a narrative about some of her behavior that left me feeling absolutely paranoid. Impulsive and risky behavior such as gambling, reckless driving, unsex, unsafe sex, spending sprees, binge eating or drug abuse, or sabotaging success by suddenly quitting a good job or ending a positive relationship. You know, for young adults, for that that prefrontal cortex, before the prefrontal cortex grows in, for, for young adults somewhere in their mid-20s, we see that kind of behavior as kind of the norm, typical much more typical than before. And when any of us are, are triggered, you you know that your, your prefrontal cortex goes offline. You become irrational and take risks. I was talking to a family recently and I was pointing out that between the parents and their daughter, I was explaining like you're both each other's trigger. Know that. It's okay to own that. There's no shame in that. It's just, it's it's what family members are to us sometimes. It's easy for us to lose ourselves in the presence of others in our family. And you can get into these, these kind of traumatic responses, trauma-based responses. Suicidal threats or behavior or self-injury, often in response to fear of separation or rejection. Again, it might not be that severe, but we can imagine how much will people miss us, right? We can feel sorry for ourselves and imagine. We can get to the point where we feel like there's no way out and there's no hope. There's no solution. Wide mood swings lasting from a few hours to a few days, which can co- include intense happiness, irritability, shame, or anxiety. That's probably pretty easy to relate to. Ongoing feelings of emptiness. While we might not experience that on a regular basis, like somebody suffering with bipolar, with a borderline personality disorder, we of course can all relate to periods of time in our life of feeling empty. I think during COVID, I've experienced, heard from a lot of people that have expressed an existential kind of crisis for themselves. Inappropriate, intense anger, such as frequent losing your temper, being sarcastic or bitter, or having physical fights. Again, the 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 person suffering from the disorder is consistently displaying these symptoms. And and any of us can have moments of regression, moments of of trauma, of of being triggered, where we can fall into many or or nearly all of these characteristics. So that's, that's a little bit about the disorder. It's really bipolar functioning is really the, the part of the disorder that's about polarized thinking. When I talk about the eight tools for communication in, in my new book or in the podcast that I did about it, well, I, I remember just recently I was doing an interview with Molly Carmel about her book, Breaking Up with Sugar, and talking about disordered eating. And at one point during the podcast, I was talking about this, this middle path, this middle way. And at one point she said, isn't that almost always the answer? Right? I think it's so, it makes us feel safe to split everything up into a binary. Good and bad. You know, the greatest works of art and literature 
greatest movies that we see, what they do for us often is they will help us know that the villain isn't all bad and the hero isn't all good. And you'll, of course, recognize that theme over and over and over in great works of, of, of literature and movies. And what the artists are trying to teach us is this, this, this way out of the borderline type of functioning, type of thinking. And in our public discourse, again, without getting into any specific issues, I think a lot of people these days are, are kind of responding to this, this divide, this divisiveness, and they're responding with divisiveness. It doesn't matter what side of the equation that you're on and, and the divide. If you're responding with divisiveness, the division is winning. If it's with your wife, your husband, your child, your friend, people that you care about, that you're close to, or the relationship with matter, matters, it takes mental health and healing to kind of see the similarities. I've always thought, and I love this happening out in the field. There are a lot of ways to kind of talk about mental health in very general terms. One of the things that I've really enjoyed is this idea that one measure of mental health that I like is that you see the similarities between yourself and others. It's not an end-all, be-all characteristic or measure. But more often, generally speaking, it's evidence of wellness. It's evidence of, of mental health. Our desire for evil to be out there, right? To be in the other. To not reside in us, if you will. That the badness can't be in us. That's a borderline way of thinking. To not own, to not integrate, to not see all of ourselves and to project out onto others. And that's what we do with our children. That's what we do with our spouses is we turn them into the bad object instead of owning our anger, our pain, our hurt, our sadness, our powerlessness, our, our limitation, our, our humanness, instead of owning all of that. That's why the subtitle of my new book, Learning to Love Your Horrible Rotten Self, it's about integration. And it's really not horrible at all not through the lens of psychology. It's sometimes injured and wounded and hurt or unhealed or unexplored. Some examples of borderline thinking, if you're not for us, you're against us. There are only two ways to see this. There might be some typos on these slides because I just did them last minute. It's my way or the highway. It's your fault. You are the problem. I'm not happy. It took me a long time hoping and waiting for somebody to rescue me from my circumstances before I, I realized it was me who had to do it. I kept looking around. I kept looking at the person or persons I thought were persecuting me. I kept imploring. I tried to play the game of being the good person. I tried to fight fire with fire. I begged, I pleaded, I, guilt, I guilted. I acted out, I did everything I could until I realized I had I had to make a, a choice. I had to step away. I would do anything for you. You know, this is a, 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 a mistake that I talk about often. Like there's, that's not realistic. It's not even, it's not even something to aspire to. There's a great story in the book Illusions by Richard Bach. He's the same author that wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, at least the title of it. Um, the book is Delusions, and it's about a, a messiah training a, a, an apprentice messiah to become a messiah. It's really about becoming a person. The, the metaphor is, is kind of beautiful and neat. Um, but at one point, as he's teaching him about right and wrong, he asks the apprentice, the master asks the apprentice, he says, how do you know if something is, is wrong? And he said, if you do something to hurt somebody, it's wrong. So at that moment, they're sitting around a campfire, somewhere camping. At that moment, the, the master messiah conjures up Dracula, a vampire, comes out of the reeds, out of the woods, near the campfire. The apprentice is terrified to see this vampire, this, this, this ghostly vampire. 
And the vampire asks the apprentice, can I have some of your blood? I'm in great, great pain, starving to death. And of course, the apprentice is terrified and, and, and refuses to give his blood. And Dracula, this vampire, says, I don't know if it's the Dracula, but it's a vampire, describes the immense pain, the cramping in his stomach, and that he will die without it. And the apprentice gets more and more indignant and, and it refuses him, I think, even threatens violence. And of course, immediately the Messiah makes the vampire disappear. This little uh, vision that they had had, this little lesson, object lesson. And then he re asks the question, he says, how do you know if something is right or wrong? And the apprentice begins to think of a whole new way of thinking about him. It's not wise to aspire to, with our children, with our spouses, I would do anything for you. It is a, a thought that we have where we have been told that to take care of ourselves is selfish. It was our parents or our earliest context by uh, borderline thinking, right? That they instilled in us. It's it, Not only is it okay to take care of yourself, it's necessary, it's inevitable. And if you don't do it as a partner or, or a parent, if you don't make it your practice to take care of yourself, you will steal from people. You will attempt to get your needs met indirectly. And you don't model for your child them taking care of themselves in the case of parenting. Similar, my only intention is for you to be happy. That, that idea of you could be a saint, that you could be perfect. See, the enlightened ones that walk on, on planet Earth the, the enlightened ones recognize that they're scoundrels. They recognize how flawed they are. They have integrated all of the badness that's necessary for them to see in the world into themselves and see it as the project, as the work. But for a borderline level functioning thinking person, the child or the spouse or the business partner, or the colleague is the problem. We turn them into the enemy. And we think that the solution to our peace and serenity and happiness and well-being is for them to be fixed or to go away or to be punished. Something in them has to be affected. It's not my fault. It's a similar kind of thing. Like there's, there's nothing, there's no work in this for me. The problem is out there in the other person. The, the euphemism of I just love you too much. That's why I'm being intrusive. That's why I'm anxious. This idea that it comes from a good intention, I hear this all the time. This is something, again, that our early context taught into us, that when people hurt us, it's, it's, and, and we, we, we tell ourselves the story that it came from good intention, it's just not true. That idea was put into us somewhere, though. We have been taught to take care of, to protect the other person from their own fear of being the bad one. Now, here's the key. This, this is the funny thing about that's just a good intention. It's not a bad intention either. That's not the point. It's just not a good one. The intention probably was self-preservation or anxiety. You know, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. So the intention was self-protection. It was a defense against a wound or a fear. That is neither good nor bad. But when we ask our children, when we ask our family members, when we ask those that we care about, when we ask others to attribute to us good intention in every moment, for it to, for us to need to be, for it to be good in the first place. That's what I love about psychology is it takes us out of, as, as Rumi said, away from the field of right and wrong doing into the field of healed or wounded, scared, angry. Right? It takes us into a field that's more descriptive, less shaming, less controlling. Often, I, I can't tell you how many times 
during our intensive work where we will gently coach somebody who is attributing good intention to somebody who's being unkind to them or at least not caring or loving. And they'll say, well, I, I just know they had good intentions. And we'll gently redirect them and say, it wasn't good intentions. They were scared. And out of their, their fear came this desire to control or they thought that their advice was going to be helpful. That That's not good intention. That's just fear and anxiety. That's them not knowing. Maybe it's just ignorance, but it's not good. It has really no value except for the behavior itself. You don't care about me. I need you to change. Again, this, this borderline functioning is focused on other. It, it, cre it actually is the creation of another, of a scapegoat. We pin evil on other people. And we point our finger with great righteous indignation and satisfaction. We do it in our lives. We do it in public. It's what racism is, right? We do it to make ourselves feel comfortable. We look at bad actors and we call them evil. The problem with that process is we are then convicted ourselves for even the smallest of sins. I told the story in the in the most recent book where a, a colleague of mine did something really hurtful to me. And the intent was to hurt me. And when a, a mutual friend and I were discussing it, I was describing that I had forgiven her for it, for what she said and did. And my colleague said, you're a better person than I am. And I said, I don't think that's it. I don't think this is me taking some higher ground or or, or this is me trying to, to, to rise above it. I said, if I hate her for what she did, I'll have to hate myself because I've done things similar. And I can't bear that, so I, I choose to forgive us both. It doesn't mean I can't have a boundary. It doesn't mean I have to be in relationship with this person. It doesn't mean I have to expose myself to the probable or possible hurt going forward, but I don't have to carry around hate and anger for this person. And I'm not doing it to be virtuous. I'm doing it to survive. I love this quote from J.D. Gill in the Letters of Juliet. I confess, Juliet says, I confess. I had never thought of myself as being especially angry before. I just thought of the world as sadly out of balance, tilting in an unfair way. This is where Juliet's having a dialogue with her, her, her mentor, right? Her magical helper, Marith. And she's beginning to understand that her anger is hers. That her anger is hers. And Marith explains to her that most people don't think that they're angry. That's the problem. They think their anger is some, it's just a reaction to what's out there. And if, what that, if what's out there will stop, I won't be angry. And therefore, that's the solution. Now, anger is a signal. It can cause us to action. It can cause us to, to become more clear about our boundaries. Right? We can take action with it. But to kind of remain in anger is to be the victim to ourselves, right? When parents ask me, will my child forgive me? My simplest answer is when they grow up, they will. Because that's what people who do grow up do is they, they, they understand, they forgive. And you have made and will make and do make lots of mistakes with your children. Sending them to wilderness, our, our wilderness therapy program at Evoke may or may not be one of them. But if they're going to grow up, they're going to have to figure out how to move past the dents and the bruises to attend to them, all of them that you caused. And so it's not your business for them to forgive you. Your business is just to show up and, and, and gently, lovingly, kindly give it back to them by just letting it be okay. Connie Zwieg 
who wrote a couple of books around, about the shadow. And the shadow is Carl Jung's idea of these discarded parts of ourselves that we don't want to look at. I love this quote from one of her books. One of her books, she said, I began to believe that the way I led my life was the source of my pain. Just think how simple that is. What if, you know, in, in, in Buddhist thinking, and Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk and writer, says this all the time, peace and serenity are possible at any given moment at every step. He says pain is inevitable. Pain is a part of, of love, and you can't have one without the other. But suffering, is what he calls suffering, is avoidable. And I think in times, I know it's a tall task right now. I know the world is a really painful, pain-filled place right now. I know there are challenges that, that, that deserve our empathy and compassion in abundance, that deserve our action and attention our energy, all of that. And fundamental peace and serenity are your responsibility. And I think the way the world is right now and kind of what I see overflowing, it's been going on for a few years now, I think is evidence of this lack of awareness and this, this kind of borderline split off part kind of thinking, enemy out there kind of thinking, good and bad, evil out there kind of thinking. Melanie Klein, the great developmental psychologist, described in human beings this kind of two-stage process that we go through in life. She says stage one is the paranoid stage. And some people never get out of it. But it's a, it's a young stage. It's a, it's a borderline functioning stage. And the paranoid stage is the idea, the simple idea that evil is out there. In Finding Joe, the documentary about Joseph Campbell, one of the teachers says, in this, this, this philosophy, what we come to understand through the myths, the, the great stories that debunk this idea that evil is out there. And some people, because they are taking things fundamentally and literally, they, they think it is out there. But Melanie Klein said, if we make it to the second stage, which she calls the depressed stage, we realize that it's in us. And the beautiful part about the depressed stage, it's kind of, kind of got a bad name for it, but there's hope. For somebody, for somebody dealing with the disorder, a borderline personality disorder, it is overwhelming and difficult, painful, and, 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 and a very long process out of it. But for us who kind of, kind of go between neurotic Functioning and borderline functioning. That's the average person. We can find a way into this, this new way of being. Jamie Gill says in her book, Seeing in Psychotherapy and in Intimacy, she says, of course, the good kid is never the real kid. The only real kid is the whole kid. Good parts, bad parts, and those in between. That's true of us. I talk about this in therapy all the time. You, you know, the word should, for example. There's no rules about it. It's just it just doesn't make sense. The word doesn't make sense. I hear people say all the time, I shouldn't react that way. I shouldn't feel that way. The fact of the matter is that you do, and instead of trying to should yourself out of it, maybe you could replace that with a practice of curiosity what would happen if instead of saying I shouldn't be angry, I shouldn't be embarrassed, or I shouldn't be this hurt or this upset, what if you said, I wonder why I am? And then, because you develop that practice toward yourself, what if you started talking to your children that way, or your spouse that way, or your friends? What if we replaced should and shouldn't with curiosity? You know, I told the story of the woman who who was one of the parents of one of the Columbine shooters who perpetuated the Columbine massacre. It's a very well-known story, and she writes about it in her book, about where her son wrote a, an essay a couple of weeks before they committed the atrocity. And it was, in essence, a, a, a fantasy of exactly what they ended up doing. 
And everybody in the story, the real life story, was very clear and to say to the boy, the English teacher said, this is a wrong thing to be thinking about. The school counselor says, this is wrong. These acts are wrong. The parents then made sure that in their gentle but firm way to tell their child that, that he was wrong. But what if, and I'm not saying, and I have, there, are, there were hundreds and thousands of essays like that before Columbine that, did result in, that resulted in nothing like that. I'm sure in the history of the world. But what if somebody had gotten curious about what was instead of what should be? What if they really viewed it from a mental health lens and not from a simplistic kind of borderline lens of good and bad, good and evil? What would the world look like if that were the, the change that we made? Some thoughts around borderline functioning. It comes from trauma. It comes from unhealed, unprocessed trauma. It, 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 it comes from attachment wounds, abandonment. And in moments when we feel threatened, we organize ourselves and our thoughts in such a way as to protect ourselves from those wounds and that trauma. Thinking in black and white terms makes it all simple, offers us a sense of safety and stability. I talk about in, in, the, in the audacity to be you, it helps us to keep a safe distance from the disturbed. We watch characters in a movie that are evil and it makes us feel better. We look at people in the world that do evil deeds to people. And, and we comfort ourselves with the distance between us and them. I shared, I've shared many times that one of the most alarming moments of my professional career was my first night after working with sex offenders. And I had to come to terms with the fact that some of them seemed to be more courageous and insightful than me. I had entered the job thinking, for sure I can help these guys because I've never done anything like this. So they're well beneath me. And then after listening to some of the stories, it scared me to death. I could relate to some of their fundamental fears and insecurities and some of the work that they were doing was something I couldn't have done. Their brutal, courageous honesty was something I couldn't have done. And I was scared to death by the similarities. So this, this borderline thinking, borderline functioning, the problem is outside of me makes us feel safe. I think that this next principle is the most important one I've learned about borderline functioning, about clients, about children, about relationships, about life, really. Hmm. My therapist explained to me that she was working in a clinic, in a hospital with borderline patients diagnosed with borderline uh, disorder, personality disorder. And she said she very much was fascinated by how well the clients afflicted with borderline personality disorder were um, just getting the staff to run in circles. Remember, the borderline personality disorder person is terrified. They're living in a, in, a, in a constant state of instability and fear and pain and terror, right? That's their inner world. That's what the disorder, that's what that's at the center of it. Is, is intense fear and pain. At any rate, she was fascinated by this, this dance. And it came to her one time, she said, I learned by watching that you don't get to win. Win. The name of the game with somebody with, with borderline features is you lose. End of game. So I think about that all the time in a moment when I'm trying to win, trying to find a way to come out on top, to not be bad, to not own my stuff, to not realize how I hurt, how I came up short, whatever it is. And, and, and I, 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 I say in my mind every day, you don't get to win, you get to choose how to lose. 
And as I practice and I lean into that mantra, I can be free. All right? I was watching a, a therapist with a, a young woman who um, was afflicted with borderline personality features. Very traumatic, overtly, explicitly traumatic childhood. And the therapist had done two sessions a week before. The girl had struggled that, that week in between the, the therapist visits. There was suicidal and self-harming gestures and threats and so forth. And I came out. I just happened to be visiting. And I came out on that that during that week's session. And we met with her first, of course, because she was the most one in, in, in urgent need of our care and our attention. And I'm watching the therapist. The client was saying, you left me last week. You laughed when you left me. You were making fun of me. You're just doing this for the money. You didn't spend much time with me. And at every step, the therapist was refuting and saying, I met with you twice last week. Well, the second time was just a few minutes. No, it was longer than that. It was 20, 25 minutes. I wasn't laughing at you. I don't know what we were talking about when I was heading to my car before I left the field last week, but it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't that you. I care about you. You don't care about me. I care about you. And after watching this back and forth for 15 or 20 minutes, I said, I have a, an offering. I wasn't the therapist. I was positioned in a place where I could kind of see it from the outside. And I said to the young woman and to the therapist, I said, I think maybe she just needs us to know how it feels to be her. Because even if you do care about her, you're going to be gone in a few weeks when she moves on from this program. And you're not going to be with her in the rest of your life. And instead of trying to prove to her that you love her, maybe you could just hear that there's no way that she can feel loved because of these early wounds. Somebody said to me recently, when I talked about this choosing how to lose, they they offered the phrase to me, I need to stop trying to win them over. Do you try to win your children over, win your spouse over? Get them to see your way of thinking. Get them to see your good intention. Get them to see that you're trying. <clears throat> Get them to see you're a good person. That's playing in the, 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 the borderline game, which is you lose. That's the name of the game. So the key is integration, becoming a whole self. And when we're whole selves, we see other people, even the ones that we consider dastardly, and we can see pieces of ourselves. We might not commit the same horrible acts that other people do, but we know what anger and rage feels like. We know the fantasy of wanting to hurt somebody in some way when we feel hurt or scared or threatened or small. We know what rage feels like. Integration is becoming a whole person. And I talk about this, the, the keys to enlightenment. Learn to be okay with being wrong is number one. Get really good at losing. Number two, come to know your darkness and remain on speaking terms with your mental illness. Mental illness is another example of a, of a kind of artificial binary. Like there's just mentally ill and mentally healthy. And yes, the, in the diagnostic manual, there are criteria that qualify you for a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, for example. But the fact of the matter is we're all somewhere on this continuum that's theoretical anyway. And the third key is learn how to die again and again, realizing that there's a new way to think, new, new ideas to be had, new beliefs, new contexts. Sorry this slide is blurry, but I love this quote from Nietzsche. Whoever fights monsters, he says, should see to it that in the process, he does not become a monster. That's a tall order, a tall task. But, but we do it by taking back the parts. So what are the take-homes from tonight? Then I'll get to the questions. We learn to own it own our feelings, own our issues. We learn to lose. We do our work. 
we realize that the, the, the threshold that we cross when we go into ourselves to see ourselves is the same threshold that gets us to all of the most important places in the universe in our relationships. Those are the answers that we seek. They're all in there. Make you your project. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. This is not a passivity. People that do their work and make themselves the project don't stand on the sidelines. They are active. They do good in the world. They contribute positive energy into the world. They take a stand on things. They take care of themselves. They say no when they need to say no. They love courageously and authentically with great abandon for the possibility of being hurt. They, they fall in love. They serve. But ultimately they realize that all the devils in the world worth fighting are the ones running inside and running inside their heads. I mean, that's, that's what this is. And that's not my quote. That's the great thinkers, right? It starts with self. It starts with the relationship you have with yourself. And then it moves on to the relationships you have with other people. So I'm happy to take any questions. Somebody says, my daughter has borderline personality disorder. She was in treatment as a teen, three rounds of wilderness and two residential facilities for three years plus. She is now 27 in a stable relationship. The mother of a three and a half year old. Congratulations to her. And it's good to see you again. Uh, the mother of a three and a half year old currently with a job and see, seeing a therapist who I think tells her that she suffers from anxiety. In all, she is doing well. That said, when something triggers her emotionally, she reverts to black and white thinking, blaming us or a boss for those things and cycling repeatedly. We support her emotionally as much as possible and lay boundaries as needed and generally have a good relationship. At this point, is there anything else we she can do? I mean, it sounds like you have it. The fact of the matter is you can't control it. You can't fix it. My daughter said this just this week. She works with me. She said, you can't make somebody feel loved. You can only love them. You can only do what you can do. And, and the thing that, that somebody suffering from borderline thinking features or disorder wants you to experience is the powerlessness that they feel. So learning to lose, learning to be wrong, to be bad, to be the problem is the gift that you give to them. But it doesn't fix anything. It just gets you free. How do I know for sure if my son has BPD? Well, you, you get him tested. That's the way you do it. You get him, you look at the somebody who's trained in either psychological testing or observation like, like myself, a therapist. They evaluate them either through testing or natural observations and they just look at the pattern. But but the BPD is, um, it's a, it's again, to, 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 for today's purposes, it has to it has to pass a diagnostic threshold for it to be the disorder but we're talking tonight about the fact that we can we can relate to all of it and it can't be diagnosed until they're an adult right we have to believe that there's that it's become cemented and borderline traits are more common in children who never become afflicted with the disorder we become we demonstrate the behavior under moments of stress or trauma, like I said. So um, it's it's not for children. It's 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 kind of learning. And, and the important thing is if you think you're in a relationship with a person with BPD is finding your way out of it. It's an insidious trapping. Those of you who have people in your life, that's what it is. It, it traps you. It sucks you in. You become a part of it. You become a part of the nightmare that they're living. And the way out is out. And that's terrifying because out is letting go of control. Out is surrendering. Out is coming face to face with the possibility 
that might never get better or worse. But it's the only way for you to be demonstrating mental health in that situation. Someone says, my child has borderline personality traits, but she did not experience sexual abuse or neglect in her childhood. How do people develop it without a history of abuse? Theoretically, it's there. It's just more subtle. It's not big T trauma. You know, it, 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 it's like a, a combination of environment and genetics, right? Everybody is prone to a certain way of presenting themselves to the world. And then trauma comes in. If you're predisposed genetically more so, then you need less trauma. Like I've said to all of us listening and watching, doesn't matter where you fall on the genetic loading equation, enough stress and trauma, and you could become psychotic. But that's obvious. We know we could drive somebody crazy if we torture them. So it's it's not about... It's not about kind of finding the big T trauma. It's about listening to them. You know, I've been saying this lately that people are always telling you the truth even when they're lying. Freud said that when we tell children that the stork brings the baby, we're telling them the truth. But since the child interprets the stork as literal, they miss the meaning of what the stork represents which the stork represents this moment in life where everything changes and there's a baby. That's what the stork signifies. So we begin to listen to our children, to our, our, our people that we care about, like they're telling us about their dreams. You see, dreams are pure truth, but we can't recognize them because they're cloaked in symbolism. And we've lost our ability to kind of see through the symbols. We, we have become metaphorically impaired. We've lost our spiritual sense. You can get some of that with training and practice, of course. So the dream is always telling us the truth. The problem is that we interpret the symbols as literal and we get lost. So the job of a parent, the job of, a, of, a, of somebody you care about, that you're invested in, that the relationship is important, is listen to them as if they are telling you about their dreams. Especially their dreams about you. My wife and I joke that once in a while we'll wake up in the morning, we've had a dream about the other person and we feel angry at the other person because in our dream, the other person did something hurtful or was the adversary in some way. And we, we always tease each other because, of course, my wife in my dream is not my wife. And I in her dream am not me. I'm a part of her story, her scene. So... Think about listening to your children or the people that you care about like they're telling you a dream. And see if you can develop ears to hear it, eyes to see what the symbols mean. See if you can lose your mind enough to understand them. That's, that's the, the, the key. How do you know if you have sufficiently worked through your wounds or your traumas? Well, I have a couple of thoughts about that. One thought is that um, you're going to be working on it until you're done. It's a life's work. So you're never done. But the second thought is that you will get to the point where, let me just pull this up, this slide up. I've put up on the screen something from, it's also in the book, The Audacity to Be You, where it talks about safe ways of responding to the other that we love and unsafe ways. And so if you find yourself responding to people with phrases like, thank you for telling me, tell me more. I'm glad to know. Glad you told me. Thanks. That sounds hard. I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm listening. That makes sense. You're not alone. Is there anything I can do? So forth and so on. Those are non-trauma responses. John triggered responses. Responses like, that's silly. You're overreacting. You're too sensitive. You're scaring me. You're being selfish. You should. Don't pay them any mind. They're just jealous. Ignore them. You'll get over it. Look on the bright side. Why did you Why did you do that? Have you tried this? Or that's just your depression, insecurity, anxiety, narcissism, defense, rationalization. Those responses are trauma responses. Calm, curious responses, patient responses are non 
traumatic response. Trauma is not bad, by the way. Trauma just is. If you lost somebody that you love, you had trauma, and it's it's a wound. It's real, and, and it's going to take some time to grieve. In Al-Anon, they say, if it's hysterical, it's historical. If it's hysterical, it's historical. And they're just saying, it makes no sense to just judge the historical overreaction, but rather dig into your history and find what needs attention and sit with it. When I present in ways that I find ugly, I've learned through therapy to be curious and to look instead of just to judge myself. How do I talk to myself? So it's a it's the answer to the question is that we we work on this work for the rest of our lives and it's not like a kind of a finished product and we're all going to have these moments and if we if we come to believe in the illusion that we will ever arrive that's the most dangerous place to to be at is that you've arrived so you just always work through it and you can recognize it by those kinds of responses that I listed. Uh, somebody says, is it true that there's a poor success in helping borderline compliance doing the work and even getting a therapist to agree to take a patient? The dysfunction is persistent and pervasive and impedes day-to-day living even after many years of treatment and supports. Personality disorders and, and, and borderline personality disorders, one of them, are thought to be more difficult to treat. And yes, many therapists are averse to them but it's probably because the therapist hasn't done the work that I'm describing here today also. It's probably because they find themselves so easily. I was just, as I was finishing an intensive today and kind of training my my daughter, who, like I said, works for me, getting her clinical psych PhD, she was describing how she gets caught in it. She gets caught in the defense and the reaction with a client. And she says, "I'm, I'm just trying to learn how to get myself out of it how to not fall into it with them. How, as J, J.D. Gill says, to not let their stink get on me. And that takes training. I, I like working with borderline and other personality disorders because it, it, it makes me work. I have to do work. It's, it's, it's fascinating to watch. And I have compassion for people that have personality disorders are suffering greatly. And they're in need of compassionate response. And yet personality disorders evoke non-compassionate responses. Narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder specifically tend to get really horrible reactions from people. And so I like working with them and some do like working with them because we know that they deserve our compassion. It's not the only disorders but it's some of them. But you're right there. Typically can be very difficult and very difficult because they they are effective at pulling the clinician or the treatment professional into it with them. First, somebody says, thanks for taking the pathology out of the borderline thinking and reminding us that we all vacillate in and out of it. You mentioned developmental characteristics in young adults toward borderline functioning. How or is that different than borderline functioning in response to trauma? Children see the world in black and white ways, right? It's very simple, very either or. They have a strong sense of justice, right? And so that's a developmental <clears throat> characteristic that we ideally we grow out of. And so borderline, again, there's that threshold of, of we're all predisposed genetically to certain types of presentations, behaviors, personalities in life. And then trauma comes in and kind of they meet somewhere at the access point, And that becomes the, the point where we have the disorder or we don't, or we have the disordered thinking or we don't. The most important thing I think I would take away from the question is it's just, <laughs> it's just work on what you can. Since we haven't figured out how to, genetically re-engineer you or your children, do therapy. Work on what you can control. That becomes the most interesting part of it. I always say to people, um, 
it's not terribly interesting why you got divorced from this person. What interests me is why you fell in love with them. Right? If you divorce a narcissist, and people tell me that all the time, or a borderline or somebody else, or a drug addict, or a sociopath, people tell me that all the time. I say, well, that's that's kind of interesting, but what interests me is, why did you? That's the more interesting question. That's the more worthwhile question for you going forward. And that's the one that you have control over. All right. Upcoming intensives, if you want to do deep work, it's, to me, the best investment you can make in the shortest amount of time. We are doing Finding You in person again with some special safety precautions. Um, we have one in June, June 24th. Uh, we also have Finding You 2 online. We have Finding You online. If you want a shorter program online, it's amazing how powerfully and quickly people get into it and experience trust even in a virtual setting like a, a, a Zoom meeting. To register or to learn more information, <clears throat> email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Our parent support groups are free for alumni. The next one is June 18th. Um, and then we have uh, intensive support groups will be July 14th. Um, and you can go to our website for free information, to download a free chapter of the book, to find out about the podcast, the new episodes, the new blog, all that stuff is now on the homepage, our revamped homepage. Uh, all of these are available by, <clears throat> excuse me, also contacting Malia at Malia at evoketherapy.com. We want all current parents to go to six, excuse me, all current parents to go to six 12-step support groups. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous. You can also go to adultchildren.org to learn about those programs. RefugeRecovery.org to learn about <coughs> a Buddhist-inspired recovery pro program, less of an emphasis on a high, higher power. NAMI.org is the National Alliance on Mental Illness to find out for free, free classes and resources in your local area. All of these broadcasts are available on the podcast app. Our podcast is named Finding You. You can find it on your iTunes podcast app or on SoundCloud apps for Android devices or on soundcloud.com. Find us on Twitter and Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy. Our Evoke Intensives program is on Instagram using the Evoke Therapy Intensives handle. On Facebook, you can search us by, by searching Evoke Therapy programs or the Evoke Family Foundation is on Facebook. And then, of course, the blog. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, and the audacity to be you are available on amazon.com and then malia and i will let you know when the next webinar is scheduled thank you for joining us i hope this is a helpful it's a little bit of a different kind of broadcast this evening but i hope it was helpful interesting for you and your personal life take care folks have a great time and i'll talk to you next week Bye bye <laughs>